I said, I had the honor and privilege of doing a few things this week. One of the hardest parts of ministry, in my opinion, and some people may disagree, is, is when you're dealing with funerals and grieving families. And on Monday, we lost two wonderful people, but heaven gained two more witnesses in the class. One of them was a long friend of mine. He's been here before and brought some of his kids from his church. He's a music minister up in Benson. And uh, his mother was near and dear to my heart for many years. Uh, and like I said, we had an old-fashioned foot-stomping, smoke-clearing, devil-chasing, Holy Ghost home going service money Amen. that ended with the entire church on their feet in praise and worship. Yes. Also, later that evening, one of our own right here in our house, uh, Robin's father, Mr. Earl, and some of you may remember him, he sat right there. I can almost see him now. He would sit right there and smile from ear to ear. And there wasn't a service that went by in his short time with us that he didn't have tears coming down his cheek at some point. So I knew God was working on him. And he, he had confirmed through several folks that in the last few months he gave his life to Christ. Amen. Amen. So I can sit here and boldly say he wouldn't take nothing for his journey either. It just goes to show you whether you've walked with him for 40 or 50 years or in that last breath you had a chance to say, Lord, help me. He's an on time God. Amen. So Robin and her family sent a, a card to the church. And it's awesome to see you guys here this morning. I know you're still swirling and whirling, but you know that he wouldn't want you in no other place. It says, with special thanks to all of you, to know you is to know people who are kind, considerate, and thoughtful. To know you is to be grateful for the special things you do, for everything you've done, for being the special people that you are. Thank you so very much. Love the Millers and the family. It's times like now where you need people to lean on. We should never forget that. And I told Robin Monday evening when we went to see her, or whatever she needed, we were here. That doesn't mean just me. We're family. Some of you thinking, well, 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 well no, we family. And I want to want to go just simply by being who you are. We want to we want to bless you this morning. That's okay. Who's my oldest married couple in here? Who's got the most years in? Don't look at it like a prison term. <laughs> Come on, anybody been married over 20 years? Over 25. Pam and Gary, Lighthouse wants to do dinner on us. Oh. Thank you for being and showing other young couples what an institution looks like. That when things get hard, you just don't jump ship. I've been institutionalized for over 30 years. My wife says the same thing. <laughs> now, the youngest married couple, and I'm not talking about age. How many of you have been married five years or under? Two years or under? Three years? Four years? Five years? <laughs> Two. All right, we're sending y'all to dinner. Me and Papa's going to go there. Now, I don't have to ask because I already know this, but I'm going to ask. Who in here has lived through the most children? <laughs> so 
See y'all need it today tonight. <clears throat> Pastor Bill. They have 19 kids. They are personally responsible for about 50% of the youth ministry. They, need, they are the magic school bus. And for it will, knowing the family. Says a man that has a quiver full. I've yet to figure out what a quiver full is. I know what a quiver is, but I don't know how you get them all, how you get youngins in a quiver. But either way, we put them all in a sleeping bag. Uh, so be, be blessed. We want to share back. Y'all spend so much time sewing into us. We just want to sew something special. And that don't mean that you're like, I knew we should have stayed married longer. <laughs> just hold on. Jonathan is coming. I'm just happy that I'm still married. Where's she at? She left. See what I'm talking about? Uh, never give your wife the keys and never leave mad and leave your keys there. That's the best I can give you. It's awesome to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. We started last week on making decisions. How many of you enjoyed it? Yes. Okay, that was three of you, so we're going to stay there. Uh, how many of you know sometimes in life it's hard to make decisions? Yeah. You can go ahead and mute that if you'd like to, JJ. I appreciate it. Um, a lot of times, and I'll get into next week how we use the Bible to help us make decisions. But last week we talked about, you know, just making more positive decisions. Thinking sometimes before we jump into something. How many of us need some help with that? Some impulsivity control. Uh, sometimes we, we, we act on our just knee-jerk reactions. And sometimes, let's just be honest, we don't always make the correct Decision. Don't leave me up here by myself. I know. I do have to say one thing, though. What's wrong with y'all? Because they all went this way. <laughs> this morning. I mean, until, until Papa and Bobby Matt and them got here, it was kind of like, this was like, what happened? I mean, is this like the COVID free zone? I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just glad y'all are here. Uh, so, Today, I want to talk about, in the second part of this, is letting the Holy Spirit help us make some of our decisions. Because there's sometimes, Dr. Mark, that the Bible doesn't specifically say if something is right or wrong. It may not address it right there in black and white. And I like to call those gray areas. Do we have any gray areas in our life? I didn't say gray hairs. But uh, in Hebrews 4.12, and, and I'll keep referring back to this as we jump in, it says, For the word of God is alive and active. Okay, let me say that one more again. The word of God is alive and active. Amen. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit. The joints and the marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes or the intentions of the heart. Now let me sit here for just a second because that says a lot. If you break it down. The very first one. For the word of God is alive and active. That is not a dead book. It is constantly evolving. So if it's alive, then it can give you Life. It is a life source. If it is active, then it should be active in your life. Can we all agree? Now, here's the part where most people kind of take a, a right or a left. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Have you ever heard that words hurt? The scripture says life and death lie in the tongue. It also refers to the tongue as a two-edged sword. So, words can cut. So, the Word of God is alive and active. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit. Now, that's deep. Let me explain something. All those classical Pentecostals out there. I, I got to word it right, Sherry. I know, I know. You have three.
three components that make you up. Your soul, your spirit, and your flesh. We'll give everybody in here a news flash. Your spirit is saved. When he formed you in his image, God is a spirit. He is not a human being. He is not the blonde-haired, blue-eyed, lily-white version that some of us have seen hanging in houses. <laughs> he was a Middle Eastern Jewish descendant. According to the scripture, he had woolly hair, runny skin. Stop trying to make him Eastern European. Just because you like that version. God is a spirit. So when he formed you in his image, he formed you in spirit form, which means you were saved. Because he's, I mean, he's perfect. Now, when you were born, you were given a soul, and then you were born into infirmity. You were born into a twisted and bent realm, so to speak. So your spirit is saved. Your soul is being saved, hopefully. And your flesh, news flesh, will never be saved. It wants what it wants. The scripture says this, and it's so popular at funerals. But I hate the fact that that's the only time anybody really wants to talk about it. It says to take off what is corruptible and put on what is incorruptible. What that means is there's going to come a time, Dr. Mark, where you take off this flesh that is corruptible, and you will step into a heavenly realm again and put on something that is incorruptible. So, hence the battle between your flesh and your spirit. Your soul hangs in the balance. That's the word. We spend so much time trying to convince people to change their mind, which would change their character, Dawson, to get their flesh in order. You cannot and will not save your flesh. I can come up here and I can lay on this altar and I can cry till my eyes are swollen shut. I can go through half a box of Kleenex with snot all over the floor. I can cry out to God and take it all away. And I can still stand up and go buy a fifth of alcohol and get drunk before lunch. Why? It boiled down to a choice. Because if I had spent my life drinking to hide things, which I did, I never really understood how to fix what was hurting on the inside, but I could come sit in a church, I could come play drums, I could come sing on a worship team, I could come work in connections, I could come hang out in the nursery, I could serve and make you think that I had it all together because my flesh looked like it was right. But my soul was dying. It says the principalities of the air are fighting with the angels over your soul. So when we make decisions, when it says here that the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, that it penetrates even dividing your soul from your spirit. <coughs> the joints and the marrow. Any anatomy freaks in here? All you medical people ought to jump up. When you take apart the human body, you see how muscles are intertwined and how joints are intertwined and how if you separate the bone and the bone marrow, how, how it's one in the other fits like a glove. It says the word of God can even separate that. Because it judges the thoughts and the attitudes or the intentions of your heart. Come on. You can do all the right things with all the best.
bad intentions. Come on. Well, guess what? You can do some really terrible things <laughs> and have good intentions. It all boils down to that one word, decisions. And who's guiding me in my decisions? Is my flesh guiding me in me? Is my soul pulling me toward a direction? Or am I willing to listen to my spirit? But if you have no idea how to even hear that, you're fighting an uphill battle. So today we're going to discuss how to listen to the Holy Spirit when we make decisions. Is that okay? Amen. Now I think it's important in life because we're all faced with, with decisions throughout life. And some are black and white, but most of the time we have a lot of gray areas in our life, or at least I do. I don't know about you. Sometimes we're presented with choices that are, are polar opposite, and it's easy. Sometimes we have a good choice, we have a bad choice. We have a right choice, we have a wrong choice. That's pretty simple, Troy. But what happens when they start clouding together? What if it's not obviously black and white, Chris? What if it's good and good? Or great and great? What if it's I don't know and I don't know? What do we do then? In those situations... A lot of times it's not clearly spoken to in the Word of God. So we're sitting here scratching our head. What do we do? Because the Bible doesn't give us answers for every scenario in our life. It gives us principles that we can pull on. <clears throat> Excuse me. But still, what do you do when it's not right or wrong? Most of us know right from wrong. Good from bad. But sometimes we need some spiritual guidance. Take something like marriage. Let's say there's been a breach in the covenant. I know we have some little ears in here, so I can keep it PG. The Bible says that that's grounds for a person to be free from that covenant. If you violate it, according to the Bible, I have a right. To bounce. The Bible says that's grounds for a person to be free, but that doesn't always mean that that's the right decision for that person. You've got biblical grounds to leave, but you may have something influencing your decision that will guide you to move from one area of growth into another area of growth. I know some people that's ended marriages over very simplistic things. And I know some that have been free from their covenant. They end up in my office and they ask for advice. But at the end of the day, I believe sometimes people make mistakes. And sometimes during that mistake is when God can really begin to mold them. I knew that one was going to be a hard pill. Other times in scripture you see Peter abandoned one career for the sake of ministry. Have you ever been presented with I got one job here but I got another job offer here and we don't know which one it is. You know what? The Bible doesn't say anything about abandoning one career for another. There's nothing right or wrong about changing jobs, Pastor Chris. There's, it has nothing to do with morality or immorality. So what do you do in situations like that? You have to make a decision that cannot simply be discerned by your five senses. It's not explicitly spoken to in Scripture, so that's when we need some extra influence. A lot of us know what it's like to be under the influence. But my challenge today is can we get under the influence of the Holy Ghost? Can we get under His influence? Can, can we and will we allow Him to help us make those decisions? There's two ways to understand. I have people ask me all the time, well, how do you know when the Holy Ghost is talking to you? Because there's a lot of preconceived notions about the Holy Spirit, and depending on what denomination you were brought up in, 
is going to give you a lean toward one way or the other. But at the end of the deal, there's an inclination by something that is greater than you or your consciousness. So I'm going to tell you two simple ways to know. The Holy Spirit will either restrain you or encourage you. Now, when I say restrain, I don't mean he's physically going to knock you down. Because like I said, God is a gentleman. You may say, well, I read the Old Testament, and there wasn't nothing real gentleman about that. God's not going to force himself on you. So he'll either restrain you or encourage you. Let me give you an example. There's a passage in the book of Acts when Apostle Paul is trying to sort through. He's getting ready, basically, to make some decisions on where he should go next in ministry. Now, I'd like to say it like this. If you're going to do ministry, I believe you're doing a good thing. Doesn't matter where you end up. I think we can agree with that. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> to do ministry is not immoral. It's definitely not unproductive. So if we agree that it's productive and a good thing to do, did it really matter where Paul ended up? Yes, it did. <laughs> we talked about it last week. There's a perfect will or a preferred will of where God wants you to be. But then that decision is up to you. He said, I thought about going to Bithynia, which is in Asia. But the Lord of the Spirit restrained me. And I thought about going to another place, but still the Spirit restrained. And then a man in Macedonia came and said, we need some help over here. He said, and then I knew where I was supposed to go. But what if he had to listen to the man from Macedonia? What if he'd have just been like most ministers? They get a word. And they get wound up tighter than a three dollar bill. And I gotta go. I gotta go preach. I just got saved six months ago and God's called me to preach. Preach what to who? I've been doing this for almost 15 years. And I still get intimidated sometimes. I got a word. A word for who? Have you ever thought maybe God gave you the word? Yes, he gave me the word, Pastor. Maybe it stopped there. I love telling young ministers this. Slow down, or God will slow you down. God will give you a microphone and allow you to fully embarrass yourself. Trust me. I know. Y'all catch that on the way home. Do you see how the Spirit influenced Paul's decision? There was nothing in the Bible that said, Thou shalt not go to Asia. I know some people that will not move unless the Bible said, Well, the Bible didn't say anything on that. The Bible didn't speak on that. Yes, it did. It gave you principles. But out of those principles, you have to pull decisions. All these places had legitimate needs, but all of these places were not Paul's responsibility. So he had to lean and depend on a sixth sense, so to speak, and understand that the Holy Ghost was restraining him from doing something. That he, ought, he wanted to go, Sherry. There was nothing wrong. He could have went. But God needed him in Macedonia. And he sent a messenger to ask for help. See, there are times that the Spirit has to lead us by restraining us. Ain't that, don't that kind of sound like an oxymoron? How can you lead something and restrain it at the same time? You ever dealt with a wild horse? Yeah. You still put a halter on it. You still put a lead line on it. But don't think for one minute that you have control over that 1,500-pound ball of muscle. If he wants to go left, you can pull all day long to the right. He's taking you and himself left. But if you work with him long enough and you stop trying and start training him, 
you can get to a point where you can drop the lead line and when you turn right, he turns right. When you turn left, he turns left. He doesn't need to be snatched or pulled or prodded. That's the kind of people that God's looking for. When God says move, you don't ask questions. Where are we going? How are we getting there? Who's going with us? Who's going to meet us there? You just say yes, Lord. That's the most popular one. Are we there yet? How many more meetings we got to have? Can you get it right? I had a person tell me the other day, hey, I think this would work. I really, man, I think if we just jump on this right now, we'll be all over it. And I'm like, I gave you that idea four years ago. Where were you? It took four years for it to completely download? That's what I wanted to say. But I said, you know what? That's a great idea. I think you need to run with it. They're like, yeah. And I want to go, Lord. <laughs> If I got to wait on a four-year delay on everything? No, it just takes some people that long to catch up, I guess. It's okay. The, the fact of the matter is, they listen. Come on. We'll catch that on the way home, too. How about this one? This could fit all of us. You might be engaged in a conversation and about to disclose something and all of a sudden something inside says, shut up. We need to exercise some restraint. We like to say, we give him prayer requests. I just need you to pray for such and such because blah, verbal diarrhea. Hush, everybody don't need to know that. There's some information you can give to people and that's fine. They'll take it to a prayer altar and leave it there. That's as far as it'll go. There's some people you give that same information to and everybody in the world will know it. So don't put yourself in that position. And it's the reason a lot of people have trouble communicating with people because they've been hurt. Their trust has been broken. So we walk around and we just blast stuff on social media because there's really no responsibility or accountability behind it. Oh, there's times I tell you to count to 10 before you hit post. Hey, sometimes I have typed a lot faster than my brain or my spirit was working. I keep the Holy Ghost active. Because there's a lot of things my flesh wants to say, Dawson. <laughs> You'll type out this whole dissertation and the Holy Spirit goes, nah. Hit that back button. Put the phone down. Step away. Amen. So then you get the wild thing. Well, just go to their house. Because <laughs> the word says, oh yeah, I'm biblical. The word says, you got a problem with your brother, you go to him. I'm going to go to him. And as you get in the keys and get in the car, the Lord said, no, that ain't what that meant. Go to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Get some of that Lord's chicken, that anointed grease, and I have a blessed day on the way out and go home. Say amen. amen. And you let it work itself out. Because you was fixing to make a mess and then justify it by stamping God on it. We're going to get into that in a minute. I ain't got there yet. Sometimes we just have to understand that the, the restraining of the spirit is our safest bet. For us. Have you ever been about to sign a deal and you felt something like, huh, maybe not the time? Mm -hmm. Maybe there was something you were fixing to engage in, maybe make some moves or some transactions, and all of a sudden you felt a check in your spirit. You're fixing to open your mouth. Like I said, you feel a check. You should recognize that. That's the Holy Spirit, guy. Now, I ain't got to give you a, a, a six-week class on that. That's, and that's just my conscience. You call it what you want to. That's the Holy Ghost. Amen. Saying, now, Dawson, you can still do it. And I'm going to still love you. I'm going to still be with you. You're going to make a mess. Yeah. This is not the time to turn into Frank Sinatra and say, I did it my way. Because <laughs> God will give you your way. 
See, there's some times there where you're not fixing to do anything that's immoral or illegal. You just got to make a decision. But that outcome may be unpredictable. And so you need a little help. I'll give you a time when everything in my body, a couple times, I'll give you some examples. When I first got married, that my mind made up. I'm going to Florida. I'm a Florida boy bound in my head anyway. I'm born and raised in North Carolina, but I'm going to Florida. Why? Why? Sunshine. I like it. I can live in a beautiful town called Ocala. You know anything about Ocala? It's country. It's horse country. I was raised on horses. It's beautiful country. It's about 70 minutes from Tampa on one coast, about 90 minutes from Orlando. So I got the best of both worlds. I can go to the East Coast beaches or I can go to West Coast beaches. I can be in the middle of Disney World or I can go to Tampa and watch my Tampa Bay Bucks go Bucks, Super Bowl champs. All right. It's been a long time since I could actually say that. Shameless plug. The thing is, when I got married, I got married to a, 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 a wonderful, beautiful soul of a woman who was extremely close to her mother, which is fine. I love that. But she made it very clear to me, we are not moving. Now, I thought she meant we're not moving to Florida. And Jerry, I can understand that. That's the okay. best love of my life. I'll, 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 I'll finesse her. I'll massage her. Literally and figuratively. Whatever it takes to get out of the state. But when I didn't realize, Pastor Donald, when she said we weren't moving, we moved next door to her mom. We literally didn't move. You can count the steps. I'm just one, two, and you were there. Like, okay. I didn't realize I was marrying her and her mom. And her little bro. I married all. I got a package deal. And I wouldn't trade anything for it. I'm doing it to make light of it. But I just knew that I knew, I knew where I was going. But the Holy Spirit knew better than I did. And I was too dumb then to even realize. I, it's like this. I grew up in church, and I loved the Lord. But for several years in my life, me and the Lord had an understanding. Mm. Y'all ain't figured that one out yet. <laughs> Lord, I ain't going to go so far, but I ain't going to be who you need me to be either. I'm just going to be honest. I've dealt with church folk all my life. They mean, they ill, they got attitudes. At least my people that I'm associating with treat me normal. I don't get that old evil eye when I show up on Sunday. I walked by the pastor before him. Whoo, had a rough night, didn't he? As I'm going to the drum set. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, play that next song. I'm, I'm, I'm transparent, I tell you. I knew how to do church. I could dress up. I could do the whole part. But on the inside, I wasn't right. So, little did I know at the time that God was using her to help shape me. Because she is the one that eventually got me to refocus, Jeff, on what was really important in life with God. And so I started walking away from some of the things I thought I needed that I thought was still holding me. And I got to see and meet some people just that were real and not just a bunch of phony. And when I met real people, my perspective kind of changed. It's like, wait a minute, you, you sure you saved? You sure you're a Christian? Because you talk different. You act like you really believe what the book says. Come on. Come on. That's when you start separating, like it talks about. So I found positive people to put in my life, and that kind of helped me really form a real relationship with God, not just one we talked about. And that's when I realized even in my darkest days and even in my dumbest moments, the Spirit was still giving me nudges. Because like I said, my spirit saved and sent from heaven. It still wants what's best for me. Right. I'll, back, I'll back it up. I'll back it up because I know there's some people probably blowing up online right now. It's okay. The Bible says, no man 
comes to the Father unless drawn by the don't think you sat on a back row somewhere and felt so bad for yourself that you, I just got to get my life right. I just got to give it all to Jesus this morning. Yes, you do. But there was something inside of you that was not. Because it said, my sheep know my voice. You didn't do anything except make a decision. So I made that decision. I rededicated my life. I said, okay, God, I'm fixing to go with this 100 miles an hour because I've never done that. I was always a little in, a little out, enough, enough to be scary. So I said, I'm going to give it all to you. And I watched my life go through some dramatic changes. Some good, some not so good. I was like, hold on. I thought this same thing was supposed to be in the, not, ooh, in the flower bed in the better. No. There's some crazy stuff that goes on in your life when you're trying to fix some stuff. Yeah. And so as we got older, we eventually moved. Not to Florida. <laughs> we moved across town, which was great. Privacy. Kind of. But still, there was a part of me that wanted to move. And I never really talked about it much. But then all of a sudden, before the move, we decided to have a brilliant idea. Because I really felt God pulling me in a direction. I had went to several churches and had plenty of offers on the table to pastor. None of them were here. They weren't. We had one offer down at the beach. Who don't want to work at the beach? Come on. An established church. That's a nice way of saying a mess. <laughs> Let's put it this way. There was a reason they needed a pastor. <laughs> so we would go and then I would get in the car and they basically offer us whatever. And my wife would look at me and say, we need to pray. Because one or two things that happen here, they'll kill us or we'll kill them. And we didn't mean physically. She understood what God was putting in my heart, even when I couldn't see it. And what God was trying to do is birth what you see now. You know how hard that was? Not to plant in the church, but to plant one in a town you grew up in. I'm thinking to myself, who in the world is going to come that knows me? <laughs> I mean, seriously. We laugh, but you think about it. You lay out all your laundry list of junk and say, guess what? I'm saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. Y'all come. Okay, it's got to be the Lord. He ain't set on fire yet, so... But even times after that, I didn't believe in what I was doing because I was like, who's coming? But God said, you just stay the course. He would nudge me from right to left. And we began in, in, in what was a single wide trailer for two weeks. Then we moved to a school. Then we moved to an old motorcycle shop. We redid it. Now, guess what? la da 13 years later, we're here. But what if I had to listen? What if I just said, you want to stay married, we move it. Probably wouldn't still be married. But you say, well, that's pretty easy, Pastor, you love me. Well, guess what? The church had just really started growing in our old building. And I get a phone call. I've had this job offer three times. First time, I didn't even look at it. Because I had just got married. I knew if we couldn't go to Florida, we sure couldn't move to Pennsylvania. I can't go south. I know she's not going north. <laughs> she hates cold weather. Amen. So this time around come the Milton Hershey School in Pennsylvania. Dr. Mark Lundin Will. We had a job offer. They had recruited me for three years to come be a house parent in their housing facility because my background fit what they were looking for. And they offered us a considerable amount of money. Basically, it was about triple what we used to making down here. 
She did an hour and a half phone interview and had no idea what she was talking about. I was giving her cue cards while she was on the phone. She had them on speakerphone, and I was writing the answers for her. And she would read them. But guess where the nudge came from? I'm looking at it. I said, I don't believe God would have put something in our lap. Now, that wasn't wrong if I had changed the job. It wasn't immoral. It was a great opportunity. But I said, God, if you want us to go, I'll go. I don't want to leave like I don't. I love the people. But if it's what I'm supposed to do, I'll do it. Then I said, but I, if it's you, let everything fall where it needs to fall with no problem at all. We were taking spring break to go up that way, so we were going to leave our family for a couple days and go hang out with them a couple days. Everything's great. They called. Only one change to the contract, and it was minute. I mean, if anything, you wouldn't even have blinked your eye at it. And we declined right there on the spot. And I said, are you sure? I said, yes. I said, because I completely, for the first time in my life, put something completely in God's hands. And I said, if anything, anything, I'll walk away. And like I said, it was something small that you wouldn't normally blink an eye at. It would basically be like, uh, we don't allow white shoestrings on campus. We need purple ones. I mean, it was something really, I mean, minute in our contract. But that's all I needed. And I turned down a lucrative salary to do what God called me to do. Because I listened to the Spirit nudge me. Now, don't think that I hadn't thought about that from time to time when people start acting like they lost their mind. Because I do deal with adults, and I expect them to be adults, not children. But some of us get on social media and turn into eighth grade drama queens. And that don't mean if you're a male or female. I had an inner peace when I said no to it. I knew everything was going to be okay. But then, we talked about marriage earlier, we ran through a rough spot. And something that had been hurting my wife for a long time that I didn't know, she looked at me one day and she said, I have no idea why you stayed. You could be anywhere in the world doing what you do. I feel like I'm holding you back. And something hit me like a ton of bricks, Dr. Mark. She'd have never felt that she was holding me back if I'd have never planted the seed in the beginning. Because all I talked about was how much more opportunity there was in Florida. How much better it would be to raise a child. They would have all these opportunities to flourish and grow and do this. I planted a seed early and now I was reaping some of the harvest. And it hurt, though. Because I would do nothing on this planet to hurt the woman I love intensely. And I watched her sit in my arms and cry and realize she had been holding on to this just for years. She thought she kept me here when it was the whole time it was God. God put everybody in this house for a reason. And we're just beginning. COVID can't slow us down. If God ordains something, it's coming to pass. No matter what happens. Censorship can't slow it down. You may try to impede progress, but God's word is going forward. He needs you. But he needs you to understand how to listen to him when it's time to make decisions. I understand that we all sometimes don't completely 
discern the spirit and we still make bad decisions. And it's okay. I, I want to be candid just for a minute. If I got about five minutes, I'll turn it loose. There's times when we make some dumb decisions and blame it on God. Well, God called me to do this and then it don't work. Who looks bad? Everybody knew your reputation. That's why when, when radical Christians and progressive Christians get together, they scare me. Because they make God look terrible. God don't fit in my wheelhouse of beliefs. I'm supposed to conform to his. Amen. Let me say that again for the cheap seats. God didn't call me to conform to my beliefs. He called me to conform to his. That's why I say he's my king. It's not the other way around. God, I'll serve you as long as you, long as you meet these requirements. No. How arrogant is that? But we do it all the time. You know why? We hang our church bylaws on. You can come here if. I want to look at people and say, who are you? The Bible says, come as you are. Ye that are troubled and heavy and burdened. It didn't say, y'all come when you got it all together. I could stay there a while, but I won't. Just like our soul and our spirits are intertwined. Sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between what's my emotions and what's his actual spirit. There are things you want. And that's okay. But when you are struggling to filter between, what does the word say? His spirit will be separated like joints and marrow. The word of God is what will separate it. Is this just my ambition? Am I trying to prove something? Is it greed? Do I have a lack of contentment? It may not always lead to a wrong decision, but the Spirit will expose the motive behind it. There's nothing wrong with wanting a better job, but why do you want a better job? Is it to have more money? More fulfillment? God may need you at that job where you're making less money because there's a direct person in your path that can change the world, but they'll never know about God if you vote. Yeah. Yeah. So find out what the intentions are behind it. Don't ignore the divine promptings of the Holy Spirit because they might just be pushing you in your purpose. And we all need to learn to be a little more sensitive when Debbie's talking. We get so super sensitive when our BFF is talking or our spouse is talking. But I believe the Holy Ghost is uh, even better than E.F. Hutton. Y'all don't know who E.F. Hutton is. That used to be the commercial. When E.F. Hutton talks, everyone listens. I think when the Holy Spirit goes to talk, we should all listen. We need to make sure the spirit is behind the wheel. It can save our life. We have to be able to recognize it. We have to be able to utilize it. As Paul told the church at Thessalonica, whatever you do, don't quench it. I grew up in a Pentecostal church where don't quench the spirit, don't quench the spirit. And that was usually when everybody was running laps to it. That is not what that scripture means there. It has nothing to do with shutting down your exuberant praise for God. It has everything to do with don't quench the spirit when he's trying to talk to you. Yeah. Don't shut him down, guys. Don't put on your, your headphones to block him out. Put on your headphones to dial him in. Go ahead and hit some soft music there, brother. My desire for everyone in this place, whether you're here or online, is for us to be able to recognize when he's talking to us. Grace, there's things in life that you want. 
That's okay. But run them through the word of God and say, how does this apply to me? Everything from your boyfriends to your grades in school to your jobs to the relationships you're going to meet 20 years from now. Run it through his word. He will not leave you or forsake you. But we've got to fully and, and biblically understand what God is saying when he gives us nudges. There's sometimes we watch things and he'll give us a nudge and we just ignore it. We listen to things and he'll give us a nudge and we'll ignore it. I went through a period in my life years ago God, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to look at this anymore. I don't want to think about this anymore. Just take it away, Father. Blow my TV up. Blow. It. God, I ain't gonna do all that. Why? Because He's not gonna make the decision for you. Because there's something empowering about making the right choice. There's something about making the right decision. It gives you a little bit more security. Not control. But to look back and not know that there's one, two, three, four, five empty chairs. There's a lot of things I can do to fill those chairs. I can make people move. We can put stuff on faith. We don't have giveaways. But those five that sit there, Dr. Mark, may not be the five that God intends to sit. So what if I pray, Jeff, and it may take a little while. You know how long it's been since we had a live keyboard player? I can go pay one tomorrow. You think we just like doing tracks? No. We try to add to it with a little bit of stuff. But it's what we have to do right now. And we can murmur and complain about it. But we're going to still pray Whatever way we need to. You know what the cool thing about? All those musicians are on time. They don't ever complain. They ain't got headaches. They didn't have to work late. They always on key. The drummer and the bass player may not be. The singers may not be. But the rest of that band is pretty tight. But I said, God, I don't want just any keyboard player. I want who you want. And then somebody got a nudge. And they'll remain nameless. But they decided, they said, Pastor, I'm going to start taking lessons. Now you're thinking, why you want somebody just taking lessons? They're going to be like a young man playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. They're not trying to fill a spot. They're training to fill one. And I believe if they will subject themselves to training, with a little bit of training, God can drop a whole lot of anointing. And that's what I desire. I don't desire somebody that's just trained to do something. And just flows. I want the Holy Ghost to walk through them. Because that's when it works. So if I push the envelope on filling those five chairs. And I don't wait for the Holy Ghost to nudge me and say now. I may miss affecting one of those lives. And I may miss one of them affecting mine. Guys, you bless me just as much as I bless you. Do you think I send you text messages and emails and Facebook messages and Instagram messages when you're missing just because I'm worried about your attendance? If you do, I'm sorry. I do it because you mean something to me. You mean something to this house. We can't go where God wants us to go if it's not all of us because we're like the joints and the marrow and the bones and the eyes and the ears and we're all interconnected through his will not our own there's a world out there that needs us 
And I'm going to give them the best version of us we can create. Because I'm putting us all back on the potter's wheel. It may get uncomfortable at times. But when it's through, it's going to be something the world wants to see. Because only he'll get the glory for it. By your hands. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you first and foremost. For loving us, Lord. I just thank you so much, God, for wrapping your arms around us. For keeping us safe. For making us strong. For helping us make decisions that sometimes we can't make by ourselves. Thank you for putting the people in our life to help complete us on our journey. And Father, I just allow you to place your hands in my life where it's needed. Nudge me. Push me. Hold me. Let your face shine on me. So that not I get the glory, Father, but you do. I lay my crown at your feet. And I worship you. Guys, I love you more than words. You have no idea how important you are to not only me and my family, but to this house. I thank you from the bottom of our heart for everything you do. And I am so excited about where we're going. If you want to give today, our buckets are up here. You know how to do it online. Those of you that are online, I think they put a screen up to help you guys. If not, send us an email. We'll walk you through it. Another quick housekeeping before you go. If you hadn't done it, I'm going to ask you to do it. Download our app from the App Store, Lighthouse Nation Church. I've had people from all over the world start contacting us. We're just scratching the surface. I love you guys. I will see you Wednesday night. Have your face in the place. <laughs>